begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by that same spirit to be made truly wise, and to ever rejoice in his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Before I begin the various topics that I would like to discuss with you this morning, I would just like to explain that Sister asked me, what should your topic be? What can we put in the flyer for the conference? What are you going to be speaking about? And I told her that I didn't want to be limited to this topic or that topic, and I'd like to cover what I think is very relevant uh, issues that all of you, I'm sure, will uh, enjoy, something that you can practically perhaps uh, put into application. Before I do that, though, I wanted to share with you Oh, different stories that come to my mind. Uh, as you know, uh, we acquired Mount St. Michael's in 1977. And we moved from Idaho to here in 77. And so the building, uh, this is where the seminarians and priests lived. And uh, there's all sorts of wonderful stories and good memories of those early days. I'd like to share with you some of them. Some I think would be amusing. And also... I'd like to, first of all, begin by saying I was watching just a little bit of the priest, the newly ordained priest offering Mass. It reminds me of my first uh, Mass, my first uh, Mass by myself. Uh, as we mentioned in the ordination uh, ceremonies yesterday, that um, Father Krusoff and Father uh, Bernard Welp, both of them con celebrated with me, but today was their first Mass by themselves. I remember my first Mass by myself, and I, people came up to me and said, how was it? You know, like, did you elevate off the ground, or were you, you know, have any apparitions and things? And all that I could say is, it was valid. <laughs> You're so nervous, and everything you've been training for for the last six years has all come to the uh, head right then and there, that you're offering Mass, and it's you on your own. Uh, the first Mass that I had the very day after my ordination was my first solemn Mass. There's a lot of things that I had to remember, but what was very helpful was, as a seminarian, we would be assigned different positions for the solemn Mass. And eventually you worked your way up the ladder. In seniority, we became a master of ceremonies, meaning you were the one who would coordinate everything. You would know the, the priest's part, the deacon's part, the subdeacon's part, and you would know it like that. Because it can happen even with an experienced cleric or even a priest, if his mind temporarily just loses focus, he may go back to the altar and not remember exactly where he's at. And the master of ceremonies has to be able to, in a, just a split second, say, do this, or whisper, do that, etc. But I just remember my first Mass when somebody asked me, well, how was it? I said, it was valid. You know, I got through it. But as you acquire a facility and you get the rubrics down and you fine-tune everything, then you can focus, especially thinking of our Lord's presence on the altar after the consecration. I remember shortly after ordination, we had a priest meeting here with various priests from around the country. And also, uh, we had it in other places in the country, but there was such a generation gap between our young priest and some of these older priests, some of these older priests were old enough to be my grandfather. And uh, we were beginning our meetings, and before the meeting, everyone had their masses, but they had one priest to offer a mass in common for all the priests. So I was chosen on this one occasion, and before we began our meetings, one of the older priests said, I noticed how you offered mass. He says, there's no way I can express it, then you were like a sharp knife. For me and for the other priests, we're old, we're kind of worn out. We're like butter knives. We've been, we've been kind of, you know, you kind of slip here and slip there, but you're, everything is very exact, right to the books, etc. 
And that's one of the things that I appreciate uh, having the seminary in Omaha and having to work with the seminarians. It keeps you sharp because you know that the seminarians are watching and they're going to learn from you. So you have to be very clear on your rubrics, very clear on your instructions because it's not just what we teach in class, but they look to Father Gregory and Father Gronenthal and myself for the example, and we have to set that example. But I was going to say, uh, with regard to stories here, I know last year we talked about Father Anaya, and uh, we'll spare him the the uh, interesting stories about him. Father Anaya came here to board when he was just a little boy, and we talked about that last year. But I'd like to speak about uh, this year, just a couple stories before we get into our theology, about Brother Sebastian. Brother Sebastian joined the seminary at the same time I did in 1974, and uh, he was uh, interesting. Uh, he had, uh, you know, a, a way of finding out and thinking about things and, and whatever. But when we were in the seminary in those early days, it was like a boot camp. We were there to be trained, disciplined, so that we would be good religious, maybe someday, if God willing, a good priest. But those opening years were boot camp years. And if you messed up on anything, just like in a boot camp, you'd be doing, we wouldn't be doing push-ups, but we're given penances to do. And I'd like to share with you some of those penances that we had to do here at Mount St. Michael's. I, I don't know, I can't remember what happened, because if you were just in a general area where something went wrong, you got in trouble. And I remember I had to go on my knees up the stairs to the fourth floor, praying a prayer each step on my knees. And you know, when you're young, it's not as big of a deal and it's penance, and you know we're very much ingrained in us what our Blessed Mother said at Fatima. We need to make sacrifices for the conversion of poor sinners. So we gladly did that. But Brother Sebastian, now I was told you were to go on your knees up the stairs. But by the time the penance reached Brother Sebastian, he was told you are to go on your knees to the fourth floor. So what he did is he walked on his knees to the elevator, opened the door, got in, <laughs> went up the stairs, got up the elevator, and he was done. So There was another time in which, as a penance, he was supposed to pray the rosary with his arms outstretched after night prayers. So what did he do? He was outside, laid down on the grass, <laughs> outstretched his arms, was looking up at the sky, praying his rosary. So... Very interesting. It's interesting, the stories and the things you remember. I mean, it's some things I can't remember what I did last week or a month ago, but then there's stories that happened over 30 years ago and you just stick out in your mind uh, as if they happened just this morning. What I wanted to do t uh, this morning is to cover a number of various topics. The first topic is something that I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. And that is with regard to the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity. And when we think of the Blessed Trinity, we are reminded that there is one God and three divine persons. And we're going to develop on this point here. This is a supernatural mystery. We could not know this unless God revealed it to us. And clearly, in the New Testament... The mystery of the Blessed Trinity is revealed by Jesus Christ explicitly, explicitly taught. We know this from the Gospel of St. Matthew where our Lord commanded His apostles to go teach all nations, baptizing in them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, I and the Father are one in the Gospel of St. John. Before Abraham came to be, I am. What I wanted to do this morning is to go over the implicit teachings or the implicit revelation in the Old Testament about the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity. In the Old Testament, we find a doctrine of the Blessed Trinity taught implicitly. And that's what we wanted to do today implicitly revealed. We wanted to go through those references, and there are many. And the more you study the Old Testament, the more we can just admire 
the infinite wisdom of God and seeing how wonderfully the Old Testament complements the New Testament, how the Old Testament prefigures what was going to happen in the New Testament. But what are those references in the Old Testament? Well, the first thing we like to speak of is the very name of God. In the Old Testament, the name was Eloim. So in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, Eloim created heaven and earth. Now there's something unique about this Eloim. As we read in Scripture, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. But literally, the Hebrew word Eloim mean, means gods. It does not mean a singular God, but gods. But what's interesting is, in the Hebrew, the very verb, so this is the subject here, this very verb right here is a singular verb. using the plural God, but it's always understood with a singular verb following it. Now, in the Old Testament, this was not something that was just a mere mistake, for it comes up multiple times, Eloim, Eloim, Eloim. And in fact, there is a, another word, El, <clears throat> and also the Eloi ah. These are terms in Hebrew that signify singular God. But this is the term Eloim that is used throughout the Old Testament in Hebrew. <clears throat> Always used with a singular verb. In the beginning, Eloim created heaven and earth. That is very significant if you were to ask Jews today, <clears throat> why is it? That even though we know there is but one God, and throughout the Old Testament we read of this, there is but one God. Why is his name used in the plural meaning gods? And it's not just a, a one-time uh, mistake. It's not just, you know, somebody made a mistake in writing it out. It happens throughout the Old Testament. But when we go through the book of Genesis, we see something also very interesting, and that is, get these references here quickly. In Genesis 125, God is going to make man, and God speaks to himself. And God said, Let us make man to our image and likeness. That is a very significant thing. God is speaking to himself and he speaks in the plural. Let us make man to our image and likeness. And also in the Genesis 322, <clears throat> when Adam had fallen, it says, and God said, Behold, Adam is become as one of us. Once again, God speaks in the plural, us. God said, Behold, Adam's become like one of, as one of us. And also in Genesis 11, 6 to 7, when it was a, God was going to confuse the tongue of man, the Tower of Babel, God once again speaks and says, Let us confound their tongues.
This is a wonderful thing because as we look through the Old Testament, we see how God was revealing these things. Not explicitly, but implicitly. We also have in Isaiah 6, 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? Who shall go for us? And this is not just something that happens just in Isaiah. We'll find this also. We're going to be going through another quote from Genesis where God is speaking and He speaks in the singular. But when addressed by Abraham, Abraham is speaking to three and yet he sees three and yet he speaks to one. And we're going to see how this wonderfully interchanges. Once again, these are not accidental things. God is revealing the wonderful mystery of the Blessed Trinity in an implicit manner. There is a very famous quote, and this is in the Old Testament, and it's in Deuteronomy, <clears throat> and it is used today in the synagogues of the Jews. It has been used for nearly how many thousands of years? I'm sure some of you have heard this before. And it is in Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Very fascinating because when you go to the original Hebrew, what we see is, Hear, O Israel, Jehovah, Elohim, Jehovah, and this word is is not in the Hebrew. It says, Hear, O Israel, Jehovah, Elohim, Jehovah, and emphatically, one. And this is not the only t t uh, place where the name of God is used three times and then emphatically, one. We also have the in the Old Testament words adjectives that are sometimes used as noun to speak of God as the Holy One. Sanctus, 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 Dominus, Deus. We say that in the Mass. It's from the Old Testament. Holy, 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 the Lord God. Wonderfully repeating and reiterating three times. Holy, holy, holy to each of the three divine persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Just as here of Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord, one. Also very interesting in this, I read, uh, I'm going to summarize this in the, in the book of Genesis. And when we read this in Scripture, I believe it was either St. Augustine or St. Ambrose who talks about this. The uh, Lord appeared to Abraham. And they say, Tres vidit unus adoret. He sees three, he worships one. And I'm going to read this passage here. You can look this up in the uh, book of Genesis, chapter 18. The Lord appearing to Abraham. And I'm going to write this out because I think it's very significant. The Lord, and once again in Hebrew, this would be the word used as Jehovah, appeared to him, Abraham. And what did Abraham see? There appeared to him three men. And as soon as he saw them, he ran to them. Talking in the plural. So he ran to meet them. And what does he say when he meets them? And he said, Lord, if I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away from thy servant. 
And when they had eaten, they said to him, Where is thy Sarah thy wife? He answered, Lo, she is in the tent. And he said to him, And the Lord said to Abraham, When you read this whole uh, passage here, the Lord appeared to Abraham. He saw three. He ran to meet them. The Lord speaks to Abraham. Abraham speaks back to the Lord and just interchanges back and forth. Very, very interesting. And when you read the commentaries by rabbis trying to explain Elohim or Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Or how you have the word Elohim, gods, with a singular verb. Very interesting how the, the Jews, the rabbis through the years, are trying to get out of this, 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 uh, this dilemma because it very much points to the Trinity. And it says, continuing on in his book, on, on Genesis, and Abraham is once again still the, the, the uh, God appearing to Abraham. And Abraham walked with them. And the Lord said, Can I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? And Abraham stood before the Lord. So I don't think it's necessary for me to write this all out. but And he walked with them and the Lord said, and Abraham stood before the Lord. Singular. Very, very interesting. Now we get into in the Psalms. We know that throughout the Old Testament there are many references to the Messiah. And one reference is in Psalm 109. The Psalm begins, the Psalm written by King David, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make the enemies thy footstool. If we look at this quote here, David is speaking. The Lord, and this term here, Lord, there, would be Jehovah, said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand till I make the enemies a footstool. The Jews, the rabbis, have tried to explain this. They're saying, well, who is this Lord that Jehovah is speaking to? Who is this Lord that King David makes reference to as his Lord? It's interesting. Some of the, the Jews, the modern Jews, would say, well, this, this pertained to Abraham. Or maybe this was Job. Or maybe it was Jacob. Or maybe it was Isaac. Or maybe it was Joseph. Or maybe it was Moses. They're scrambling to come up with an explanation. But the problem with all these explanations, they all fall short when we think of, sit thou at my right hand. There is no doubt, it is absolutely clear, that in the understanding of the Hebrews at this time, it's very clear that to sit at the right hand means equality. And who would dare to say that Abraham, Jacob, Job, Isaac, Joseph, Moses were equal to Jehovah? There's, there's no other explanation for that. But modern rabbis, there's a problem throughout the Old Testament, modern rabbis who reject the doctrine of the Trinity, who reject the divinity of Christ, they have these difficulties that are just right there. And it's interesting to read these difficulties that they face and hear them try to explain that. I mean, their explanations fall far short. The rabbis throughout the centuries since the coming of Christ, they know clearly the Old Testament. And in fact, it was interesting in the early church, when Jews converted to Christianity, they would go back to their their former acquaintances in the synagogue and explain how wonderfully Christ, Jesus Christ, fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament. And they'd show from the Old Testament that truly what 
Christians believed about the Trinity, one God and three divine persons, about the divinity of Christ. So effective were the early Christians, the early converts from Judaism to Christianity, that the rabbis have said, enough, you are forbidden to talk to Christians anymore. Why? Because there was such a tremendous influence there. It's also interesting too, when we, when we look at the further quote in Psalm 109, speaking about the Messiah, Thou art a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The Jews know this pertains to the Messiah. Melchizedek he was a priest of the Old Testament who offered bread and wine in sacrifice. But this Messiah would be a priest forever in eternal priesthood, a priesthood of eternal uh, duration. And the more you study the Old Testament, the more you realize how perfectly this is all fulfilled by Christ. There are many other quotes from the Old Testament that I'd like to share with you pertaining to the doctrine of the Trinity. And when we think of the doctrine of the Trinity, we are reminded how wonderfully the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity and the Incarnation, that the second person of the Blessed Trinity became man, the divinity of Christ. Christ was one person with two natures. How wonderfully these go together. But Isaiah the prophet, he had spoken of this coming Messiah. 7.14 You're very familiar with this around the time of Lent. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And his name shall be called Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel, God with us. Who is this son to be born? God with us. We also find very beautifully the perpetual virginity of Mary. Thou shalt conceive and bear who? A virgin is the subject of these two verbs. A virgin shall conceive, a virgin shall bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. We also have Jeremiah speaking of this Messiah. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, and I will raise up to David a just branch. A king sh shall reign and shall be wise and execute judgment and justice on the earth. And his name shall be the Lord our just one. And once again, Isaiah, this is Jeremiah 23.5. But we also have Isaiah 9.6. A child is born to us and a son is given to us and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, God, the Mighty, the Father of the world to come, the Prince of Peace. Wonderfully, it's revealed the Messiah, this child to be born, the Son to be given, will be God Himself. So even in the Old Testament, we find clear references for the divinity of Christ, for the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity. And what this reminds us is how important it is that we study sacred scripture and know it well because of the idea of defending our faith is not just giving a single quote, but reiterating, reiterating, reiterating. Now, I wanted to share one other thing with you because there's a definite reason why we're going in this direction. And this will become apparent as soon as we cover the remaining part of this topic here. The Old Testament, the prophecies pertaining to our divine Savior. As we know, 
um, the surest signs of the divine origin of our Catholic faith, there are two. One is miracles, which we'll go into a little bit later. Supernatural events that are beyond the power of any man to do. This is how God shows that what is being revealed is coming from God. And also prophecies foretelling of future events that are impossible for anyone to know but God. So we're going to dwell on, first of all, the prophecies here. These are the surest signs of the divine origin of our, of our faith. Our faith is not some blind acceptance, oh, it's in the Bible and whatever. No, God has proven that what's in the Bible is true. And the evidence, the proof is there. And these are the surest signs that demonstrate divine revelation, miracles and prophecies. I wanted to go through these because there's a $100 quote that I'm going to give after we're done with this, uh, this topic. What were some of the, uh, the prophecies pertaining to the Messiah? The Old Testament. we we'll start numbering these. The Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. And we find that in Micchaeus 5.2. And when we consider that these prophecies pertaining to the Messiah were all, they were at different times by different prophets, there's an absolute impossibility that this was any type of a guess. If you took one individual person who tried to speculate or guess about some future person and he randomly said something and, and somehow it seemed like it became true, that one singular thing by itself would not seem to be a whole lot. Anybody can guess. But when you have detail after detail after detail after detail made by different prophets at different times, all converging on one single individual, and these details are so wonderfully fulfilled by Christ, there can be absolutely positively no doubt that Christ was the was truly divine and these prophecies were verified in him. It was also prophesied that the Messiah would come at a time of the second temple. Now what is that second temple? Solomon built the first temple, a magnificent temple. That was destroyed. And when the Jews returned from their captivity began to rebuild the temple, some of the elders began to weep because the foundation of this new temple, the second temple, was nowhere near the magnificence, the grandeur, the size of the first temple. And the prophet Agio said, no matter, in this temple the Messiah will come. And that is the temple that Mary presented Jesus in. That was the temple where Jesus was found after he was lost for three days. That's the temple that Jesus preached in. That was a fulfillment. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And in fact, when the Magi came and they inquired of Herod, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen a star in the east and we come to worship him. They knew the prophecies and they knew that the manifestation of that star signaled the coming of the Messiah. These were foreigners from a distant land. It was also interesting too in the book of Genesis where Jacob, in blessing his sons, he said to Judah that the scepter would not pass until the Messiah would come. This is Genesis 49.10. Interestingly, from this time, the tribe of Judah was the leading tribe. King David was of the tribe of Judah. Zerubbabel, who brought the Jews back from their captivity, was of the tribe of Judah. When the Jews regained their liberty, they were under the rule of the Maccabees, who were also the tribe of Judah. When did the scepter pass? The scepter passed in 39 B.C. when the Romans put Herod over the Jews. And so from that time, that was prophecy fulfilled. The Jews knew they were waiting for the Messiah. They knew that that was a prophecy that had been fulfilled. Now, it's a very, very interesting, and this is something that you know a little bit about the situation. This is very, very explicit. Daniel the prophet. Daniel the prophet foretold 
the public appearance of the Messiah. What did he say? Now, I'm going to give you the dates for Daniel the prophet. Daniel lived from 605 B.C. We're working our way down now to 530 B.C. And he prophesied that from the rebuilding of Jerusalem, that's something that had not even taken place yet, from the rebuilding of Jerusalem to the public appearance of the Messiah, he said there would be 69 weeks of years. If you do your math, 7 times 69 is 483 years would come. Now, when did they start building, rebuilding Jerusalem? They started rebuilding Jerusalem in the year 453 B.C. That was about a little over 80 years after Daniel had died. They didn't even start rebuilding Jerusalem. So Daniel was foretelling the rebuilding of Jerusalem and from that time to the public appearance of the Messiah, there would be 483 years, which comes out to be 30 A.D., the exact appearance of the Messiah. And he says, and from the, the suffering of the Messiah, that this Messiah would, would suffer, there would be 69 and a half weeks of years which comes out to be 33 and a half A.D. Very, very interesting. We can go on and on and on with these, these prophecies. The more you study the Old Testament, the more you can only admire how wonderfully God had been preparing the world for this singular event that the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, would come down from heaven and become man. It was foretold, we already spoke of this, the born of a virgin of the house of David. And under this uh, aspect, I wanted to share one thing with you. That's Isaiah 7.14. We've already given that. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, sometimes someone might wonder, Matthew begins his, St. Matthew begins his Gospel, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. And it goes through the whole genealogy and when it comes to Joseph, the spouse of Mary, and says of Mary, of whom was born you know, Christ. Now, throughout this whole genealogy, it's saying Abraham begot, Isaac begot, Jacob begot, but it does not say that Joseph, because Joseph was merely the foster father. But the question is, why did Matthew trace the genealogy back from Joseph. Sometimes people may read Scripture and say, you know, oh, how did that make sense? Well, number one, that was the practice of the Jews. You trace genealogies back through the Father. But nevertheless, this it clearly indicates that Mary was of the house of David also because it was the practice, the law, that you would only marry within your tribe. So clearly, this shows that Mary was of the house of of David. But there's also other references to this in sacred scripture. But there's no contradictions in scripture. It's just sometimes people don't understand what's this all about? Why did you do that? But when you actually study the matter at hand, you see very clearly. And not only that, but as you study scripture, the wonderful thing when, when Joseph saw that Mary was with child, he was disturbed. And then the angel said to him, Fear not, Joseph, to take to, to thyself Mary, thy spouse, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And then we have these, these people who are anti-Christianity who would say that you know, Christ was not conceived by the Holy Ghost. It's clearly refuted in sacred scripture. St. Joseph was troubled, was troubled. Now we can go through, we're going to try to cover these rapidly because I there's a punchline here to all this. We're not yet there yet. But we also know that there would be a forerunner to the Messiah. We find that in Isaiah 43 and also Malachi 3.1. And that forerunner was no, one, no, no other than St. John the Baptist. If we look at the Old Testament, we find that when the Messiah would be born, a new star would appear in the sky. Let's see, it was six, this should be seven. This is in the, the book of Numbers, 
24 set 17. It was also foretold that kings from a distant land would come to worship him. This is in the Psalms 71.10. It was also uh, mentioned in the Psalms as well that the gifts that they were to bring. You look at the reference of Jeremiah in 31.15. He talks about the death of many children to be put to death. And he makes reference to Rachel weeping for her children. And Rachel... She died in Bethlehem, and that's where she was buried. So this reference clearly indicates the death of children in and about Bethlehem. The prophet Osi spoke of the Messiah having to flee to Egypt. And in the Psalms we know we were speaking of the divinity of Christ, the divinity of the Messiah. Psalm 2 Verse 7, and also Isaiah, he spoke of this 9 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, etc. God the Mighty. He'll be a, pro, uh, a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. We spoke of that already. But the order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek offered bread and wine and sacrifice, so did our divine Savior. And you keep adding these things up. And you begin to see the evidence is absolutely positively overwhelming. He'd be a great prophet and teacher. And indeed, our divine Savior, even his enemy, said, Never has a man spoken like he has spoken. This is in Deuteronomy 18:18, 18, 18, and also Isaiah 49, 1 to 6. I enjoy studying the Old Testament, and it's because of the fact as you see this wonderfully fulfilled in Christ, it strengthens your faith to say there is absolutely positively no doubt that what we believe is indeed true. And that God has not left any stone unturned. We're going to go through these quite rapidly here because we're going to, like I say, we want to get to the punchline. The Messiah would ride into Jerusalem <clears throat> on an ass that he would be betrayed. This is Zacharias 9.9. 9. He'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. This is Zacharias 11.12.13. <clears throat> He'd be betrayed by one who ate at a table with him. That is in the Psalms, there would be 40.10. He'd be forsaken by his disciples. Mm, that is in Zechariah 8.7. And I'm just going to read through this because I'm going to get too lengthy to write these uh, down. He would be mocked, Psalm 21.7. Beaten, spit upon, Isaiah 1.6. Scourged, Psalm 72, 14, crowned with thorns, Canticle 311, given gall and vinegar to drink, Psalm 68, 22. They were to cast lots for his garments, Psalm 21, 19. His hands and feet were to be pierced, Psalm 21, 17. He would die amongst evildoers, Psalm, or Isaiah, I should say, <clears throat> um, 53, 9. He was to be patient as a lamb in his sufferings, Isaiah. 53.7, he was to pray for his enemies. 53.12, he would die willingly for our sins. Isaiah uh, 53.4-7, he would rise again. Psalm 15.10, he was to make his uh, grave with the rich and it was to be glorious. Isaiah 11.10, he would return to the heaven. At Psalm 67.34, he would sit at the right hand of the Father. Psalm 109.1, his doctrine would spread from Jerusalem and Mount Sinai all over the world. Joel 2.28 uh, and Isaiah 2.3 <clears throat> The heathen nations of the whole earth were to be received into his kingdom and adore him. Psalm 21.28 The Jewish people who had put the Messiah to death were to be severely punished and scattered over the face of the earth. Deuteronomy 28.64 The seed of Jerusalem was to be destroyed as well as the temple. The Jewish sacrifices and the Jewish priesthood were to cease 
and the temple was never to be rebuilt. Daniel 9.26 OC 3.4 In every place throughout the world a clean oblation was to be offered to him. Malachi 1.11 It's the Mass. He will judge one day all men. Psalm 109.6 Before the day of judgment Elias will again return to the earth. Malachi 4.5 uh, uh, Now when we put these quotes together here we see how wonderfully these are all fulfilled by our Lord. Now, I wanted to give you a quote, and I'll tell you, we actually ask you who you think this quote was from, that is utterly, absolutely preposterous. Like I say, there's a reason why we wanted to go through all of this. <clears throat> but before we do, well, let's give the quote first, and then we'll go to these other quotes here. I'm going to write this nice and large here. It is, of course, possible to read the Old Testament so that it is not directed toward Christ. It does not point quite unequivocally to Christ. And if the Jews, and if Jews cannot see, the promises as being fulfilled in him, this is not just ill will on their part, but genuinely because of the obscurity of the text. This is a quite a lengthy quote here. Dot, dot, dot. Now I capitalize this. There is, or there are perfectly good reasons then for denying that the Old Testament refers to Christ and for saying no. That is not what he said. This quote here is saying basically that God didn't do a good enough job. If the Jews can't see the promise is fulfilled in Christ. It's because of the obscurity of the text and that there are perfectly good reasons for denying that the Old Testament refers to Christ and for saying no. Who said that? It's Cardinal Ratzinger. This is the problem with the situation today in the name of ecumenism and the idea of soft peddling other religions making excuses there are no excuses in a sense that God is revealed to mankind through Jesus Christ the religion by which he is to be worshipped Jesus Christ worked miracles he fulfilled the prophecies these Miracles, these prophecies are the surest signs of the divine origin of the Christian religion. And as Pope St. Pius X said, when he talked about the surest signs of the divine origin of the Christian religion, he said, the miracles and the prophecies, they are sufficient for all men and for all times. Meaning if somebody is looking for the truth, they can certainly find it. Even in the year 2008, if someone's saying, okay, what is the religion that I should practice? What religion is that religion that God wants me to follow? If he steadies the religions of the world, he will find historically that only one church goes back to Christ. That only one religion has divine proof, divine evidence, clear cut without any shadow of a doubt. And that is the religion revealed through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But in, you know, in the name of ecumenism, all these things have been totally, completely watered down. I wanted to, uh, before we get into the topic of miracles, I want to wrap this up on prophecies. St. Augustine has a very interesting quote pertaining to the Jews today. And I'd like to give this to you because it's a, uh, today if the Jews are dispersed throughout all nations and lands, it is due to God's design. 
so that if the idols and altars and sacred groves and temples are all destroyed over all the earth and sacrifices forbidden, it could be still seen from Jewish books that all this was prophesied long ago. And although the prophecies fulfilled in the Christian religion may be read also in our own holy books, no one can accuse us of having composed them ourselves after the event. The books of the Jews are witnesses everywhere for Christ and his church. For when the heathen, the pagan, read them, this is St. Thomas Aquinas, in the Jewish books, they could not imagine that the prophecies concerning Christ had been fabricated, fabricated by Christian preachers. So St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas are basically saying that the very fact that there's Jews today, they hold to the Old Testament. No one can accuse no pagans, no heathens can accuse Christians of making up the Old Testament and trying to <clears throat> prove the divinity of Christ <clears throat> and the Catholic Church. So clearly does the Old Testament point to Christ and to the Church. <clears throat> there were many things that were done in the Old Testament that prefigured what happens in Christ's Church so clearly prefiguring this that the very fact that God allows the Jews today to be where they're at and do what they're doing, that helps confirm Christianity, helps confirm Christ and His church because then the pagans can't think, well, you Christians made that stuff up because the Jews who hold the Old Testament don't accept Christ. But my point in mentioning these things is that today, in the name of ecumenism, so many things are being watered down. And it's very important for us to be able to demonstrate that God did not fail in His revelation. The revelation is clear. The facts, the evidence is clear. It's there. Now, we wanted to talk briefly about the miracles of Christ. And <clears throat> when you think of a miracle... A miracle is a supernatural event. Super meaning above nature. Something that could not ordinarily happen. Such as raising someone from the dead. Sight to the blind. The lame walk. Leprosy instantly cleansed. Now what's unique about the miracles that Christ worked Foremost is that they were public. They were witnessed by many, many people, even his enemies. And that's a very important point. Our Lord worked miracles in the presence of his friends, his enemies, the rich, the poor, the educated, the simple, everybody. And not only that, but his miracles were multiple. Now, when we think of the miracles that Christ worked, when we think of the year 2008, looking back nearly 2,000 years ago, we study these the, the, what things have been written about Christ, about Christianity, etc. His enemies, the Pharisees and scribes, yes, they wrote about Christ. Many blasphemous things. But the one argument that would have been the most powerful argument that they could have used, but they did not. They, 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 if, if, it, if these miracles never happened, the enemies of Christ, all they had to say is, they ne He never did these things. He didn't raise people from the dead. He didn't give sight to the blind. He didn't cure the lame or leprosy or whatever. If those events never happened, that would have been their strongest argument. But the Pharisees did not use that argument. Now we ask ourselves why. They were vehemently opposed to Jesus Christ. They rejected Him. They, they handed Him over to Pontius Pilate. They cried out, crucify Him. His blood be upon us and upon our children. If these miracles did not happen, then His enemies would surely have said, He never did those things. That's all being made up. It's a bunch of lies. It's, it's a fraud. But when we read the writings of His enemies... They do not deny His miracles. 
That would have been their strongest argument, but they couldn't use that argument because they were witnessed by too many people. And not only that, but imagine the apostles. Our Lord and Savior died on the cross, the most humiliating death, as the worst of criminals, outwardly seeming like the worst of criminals. They put the worst criminal in the middle. Our Lord rose from the dead. His apostles confidently, after Pentecost, preached about the resurrection of Christ. They preached the gospel. They preached the miracles of Christ. They're talking to people who are contemporary with these events, people who could verify, if they hadn't been there, they could easily verify, did he raise Lazarus from the dead? Did he give sight to the blind at the pool of Silo? Did he make the lame walk? Did he cleanse lepers? They could easily verify these things. If these events never happened, the apostles would have been denounced as a bunch of liars, a bunch of their frauds. And no one would have ever accepted Christianity. Christianity would have just died out. But it didn't. And because there were miracles, they were beyond dispute. And even his enemies confirmed that. So when we think of miracles and prophecies, etc., the evidence, the facts are there for our, our, our holy religion. And we know that God wills all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That truth is available for people to see it. The people to recognize the religion revealed by God. And not only that, but also to come to a knowledge of Jesus Christ and who he was, the Son of God. And that indeed he was the divine Messiah prophesied throughout the whole Old Testament. And not only that, but also that he fulfilled those prophecies and he worked miracles to prove his divine nature and mission. And that Christ founded a church. And that church is the, is the Ark of Salvation. And that gets to another topic here <clears throat> I wanted to get into. Um, there is a gentleman, we'll write his name on the board, Andrew Rebel, or Rebel, however you pronounce it. I don't think any of you have heard of him. Have any of you heard of this man? Good. He writes for Inside the Vatican. Definitely a modern defender of Vatican II, etc., now, he's been writing emails to me. He's kind of stopped after our last conversation. But he was saying, come back to the church. Cardinal Hoyas will embrace you with open arms. Come back to the church. That was his first email. So I wrote back to him. I says, Andrew, there are problems that I don't think you understand. So he started showing these difficulties contrasting them. So I said, okay, <clears throat> if you want to know what the problems are, the problems are false ecumenism. And I said, if you don't, if you wanted to refresh his memory, he's a journalist for Inside the Vatican, he should know this. But Pope Pius IX, <clears throat> in the Syllabus of Error, he condemned religious indifferentism, which is the foundation of of false ecumenism. False ecumenism is basically founded on religious indifferentism, that one religion is as good as another. It's utterly false. Religious indifference is not, it doesn't matter if you're a Protestant or you're a Hindu or you're a Buddhist or you're a Muslim, it doesn't matter. You all doing okay. You believe in something, you're trying, you're sincere, you mean well. Religious indifferentism is the erroneous belief that all religions are more or less good and praiseworthy. Pope Pius IX condemned that. We also have in the Code of Canon Law, Pope Benedict XV in 1917, this is 1864, 1917 Code forbid Catholics to worship with other religions. That's this concept of ecumenism. We all need to get together, reunite all these religions together. You stay where you're at. You stay where you're at. You believe what you believe. You believe what you believe, but we're going to all get together and it's going to all work out. We're going to all be one big happy family having our own beliefs. But the Code of Canon Law, Canon 1258, forbids Catholics to worship with other religions. You're forbidden to take active participation 
it's considered a sin against faith. And then we have also Pope Pius XI in Mortalium Animos. This is in 1929. He explicitly said, false ecumenism is tantamount to abandoning the religion revealed by God. So I wrote these things to Andrew Rebel. And I says, Andrew, what Vatican II has taught and what this modern church is teaching has been already condemned. Condemned by Pius IX. Condemned by Pius XI. Forbidden by the Code of Canon Law. You look at catechisms on the first commandment. It's a sin against faith to worship with other churches, other religions. This is the hallmark of Vatican II. That's the problem. Also, religious indifferentism. All religions are more or less good and praiseworthy. There is the decree, Etate Nostra, and I'm not making it up. You could look it up. It prays the Hindus. It says they're making a loving, trusting flight toward God. It prays the Buddhists, saying they can attain supreme enlightenment. It praised all the religions of the world and says the Catholic Church is, rejects nothing that is good and holy in these religions. And the Catholic Church's mission now is to promote the good in the Hinduism, promote the good in Buddhism, to, mo- to promote the good in these other religions. This is not the language of the Catholic faith. Christ commanded His apostles, go teach all nations, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. But when we start looking at Vatican II, and it's not just Vatican II documents, but what has followed thereafter. Uh, John Paul II said, the Holy Spirit is present and active in all the religions of the world. That's from our Sunday visitor. The American bishop signed a joint interreligious dialogue agreement with the Jews and said, it is no longer theologically acceptable for Catholics to target the Jews for conversion. And Cardinal Walter Kaspar, in a speech in Boston, reiterated that, clarified it, and says, the Jews do not need to be converted to Christianity to be saved. And John Paul II of the synagogue in, in Germany in 1980 said, the covenant, the Old Testament covenant with the, of the Jews is still valid. Still valid. Cardinal Ratzinger issued a, uh, from from the, Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, Cardinal Ratzinger issued a statement on the, on the reading of the Old Testament. He said, Catholics should not look into the Old Testament and try to find every passage pertaining to Christ because the more they, they see these passages fulfilled by Christ, the more critical they are of the Jews. And then he later on said, the Messianic expectations of the Jews has not been in vain. What do you mean it hasn't been in vain? The Messiah has come. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. They're awaiting a Messiah. They missed the boat. But he says the expectation, the Messianic expectations of the Jewish people has not been in vain. We, like them, look in waiting. The only difference for us Cardinal Ratzinger says, the only difference for us is that he who will come, he who will come will have the same traits of that Jesus who already came. He who will come will have the same traits. Hey, what are you talking about? The second coming of Jesus Christ is the same Jesus who was born in Bethlehem, who died on Calvary. Same Jesus. It's not somebody else. But as we read of in sacred scripture, when the Jews were rejecting our Lord, Jesus said, I come in the name of my Father and you, and you, you, you don't believe me. You don't accept me. If another comes in his name, you, Jews, will say it is he. And that's the problem that we face in our world today. The coming of this Jewish false Messiah is the Antichrist. And this is all being prepared so I wrote this to Andrew Rebel, and this is what his answer was. Did he argue these points? No. He said, let me call your argument A. 
He says, and I can come up with an argument B, and, and, and I won't convince you of B, and you won't convince me of A, so why do we discuss this? I was like, what kind of an argument is that? And he says, and by the way, if we get into an argument, we won't be friends. I, I was like, friends? I don't even know you. So, what happens? Okay, that, that, I didn't hear from him. Then he wrote something about the upcoming World Youth Day in Australia. And what's, what's amazing is how sometimes you can, the Holy Ghost helps you. But this Andrew Rebel called me from Australia real early in the morning. It was during the summer, right around the time of the World Youth Day. Need to stop for a second? Okay, sisters has to change the tape here, so 